Fireside Chat, Episode 18, Pre-Draft Review, recorded June 24th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Welcome back for another Fireside Chat. It's Dan and Matt tonight. Matt, how you doing? Ah, fairly well, considering the calamity that's been going on. All things considered. We want to start by uh, expressing our condolences for all the Calgarians and Albertans who've uh, suffered loss during this flood. I think we're very fortunate that nobody's lost a life here in Calgary. I know there's been a couple fatalities outside of the city. Um, if anyone is interested in donating money to help with the tragedy, we will have a Red Cross donation link on our website. So you can go to firesidechat.ca and click through to donate some money to the Red Cross. Let's talk about the Saddle Dome flooding. The Calgary Flames have announced that the first 10 rows of the dome were completely flooded. The entire event level's gone. It sounds like the arena is pretty much a write-off. Yet Ken King says they're going to be ready to go for the start of the season. I think that's probably a stretch. I don't know how they're going to manage to get it done in time. What do you think? Do you think they can meet that timeline and be ready to go for the start of the season? Well, worst case scenario is that they'll miss a few preseason games in Calgary, but those can be easily relocated to other provinces or wherever. You know, it just, uh, it'll take a while to get everything cleaned up and make sure that, like, all the electronics are working and all that. So, it'll be a, you know, a lot of yeoman's work there <laughs> to get everything back up into working order. Yeah, I, I definitely think that it's possible to have the arena going before the season starts. I'm going to be surprised if they're going to have it up for the concerts at the uh, Stampede this year, but Stampede Ground says everything will be up and running, so we'll see how they pull that one off. Oh, it it just comes down to manpower and you know, how many hours can you put in. Yeah, manpower, a lot of it I think will be getting supplies here too, which could be tricky in the next little bit. Mm-hmm. So I'm just reading an article here while we're podcasting about the dome cleanup. And Harvey's head, Harvey the Hound's head, was found floating in the dome today. You told me this before we went on the air uh, when they were sucking the water out. But apparently the rest of the body of Harvey the Hound's still missing. Yeah. So I think Craig McTavish should be brought in for questioning. Mm-hmm. I I think because uh, it apparently was the backup costume, so what they should do is just like have uh, the head on a stick outside the opposition's locker room just to freak them out. <laughs> there you go. We could we could either put it in the mail and send it to them ahead of time, or even just you know tuck it in some guy's bag in the visitor dressing room. All good. <laughs> We're doing the show the week before the NHL entry draft and just wanted to kind of talk about things that have happened in the Flames world since our last podcast. Um, Before we do, though, I want to announce that we have a winner of our Burning Questions contest, which we've been running over the last couple months on Facebook and uh, Twitter. And our winner is a fellow who goes by Not Ken King. His uh, Twitter handle is Ken King underscore Flames. So congratulations, Ken. You've won the prize pack, and hopefully it'll be getting to you soon. I, I'm putting it in the mail today. Matt, I guess the biggest change that we've seen from the Flames is that Feaster's finally calling what the team's going through a rebuild. What would you think when you heard him say that? Well... In hindsight, I'm thinking that he should have specified the Flames, not, you know, Calgary. <laughs> but, you know, it's good to see that the they're going in a new direction entirely. And I think it's important that they do say it's a rebuild, because I think that's part of the problem the Flames have had the last couple of years. They didn't define what was happening here, and they're trying to do two different things with bringing in youth, but also bringing in veterans, and it just didn't work out. So I think by finally defining what's happening, it's going to let everybody move in the same direction. 
Yeah, it's like the a dog chasing its tail. You didn't know exactly what <laughs> it's doing, so... <laughs> Yeah, and it, I mean, it's confusing, and I think it's really hurt the fan base, too, because the fans didn't know what was going on. The fans had no idea um, what to think. So, yeah, I, I think now that we know this is a rebuild, fans know what to expect, they'll know what's going on, all that sort of thing. Oh, I know. And plus, like, it's difficult to have young players trying to break into a veteran-laden squad when the first time they make a single mistake, they're back down on the fourth line or in the press box. So, you know, now that some of the veterans are gone, it'll allow them to actually get the proper ice time to develop. Yeah, very true. And I think that's really what we need, especially with a lot of the young players we have and that we're expecting to come in through the draft this year. We're going to need to give those guys the time that's required in order for them to improve and get up to speed at the NHL uh, level. Speaking of veterans, there's been a strong rumor that I think Roger Millions first reported that uh, Camilleri is in play. The Flames are fielding offers for him. What do you think about that possibility, Matt? Well, with all the players over 25, if the right deal comes along, you know, those players aren't going to be effective or on the team by the time the Flames rebuild is over. So... If you get a really good offer, why not? Because, especially with all the teams that are having cap trouble, it's not like you won't be able to be able to replace their performance. True. Yeah, well, and I'm interested to see what will happen after the draft as far as the Flames taking on guys that may be compliance buyouts from other teams. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll cover that in our lead-up to the unrestricted free agency probably next week. Yeah. Uh, If uh, the Flames can get more picks in the top 75, then they should absolutely do that. And if that means Camilleri or Tangay or Stepniak or whomever has to go, yeah, it's more important to have a good crop of young players coming through, even if they're not going to be in the NHL, because that anytime you have more competition for jobs, it you'll get the best of the best. Yeah, well, it also lets you know that you're set for a couple years, too. Even if not everybody makes it this year, you know that you have potential players for next year and the year after and that sort of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Sort of like having Jankowski and Gaudreau, like, after next season and the year after type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And and it gives you something to look forward to and gives fans something to look forward to as well. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you think we could get for Cammy? Uh... It depends if you're going solely with a draft pick. I think that if it was just for one pick, you could probably get a late first by itself, like a 28, 29, 30. But, it, yeah, you could also get, like, two second rounders or some mm-hmm. such, likely. And, I mean, there's, you know, Cammy's a centerman, can be a centerman, um, isn't always a centerman. We played him at center a lot this year. Um, I think he's officially lift, listed as a winger, but I'm not sure. Oh, no, he is a centerman, and he's played wing. That's right. So I think teams always have a need for a centerman. And like you said, you know, he can be traded. There's a lot of teams that would be happy to take him on, I think. I'd have to go back and listen to Cammy's exit interview, but I, I vaguely remember him saying something about he has to decide if he wants to be part of a rebuild or not. So that leads me to believe that he's kind of wanting out of the organization. Yeah, realistically, the Flames have to evaluate the veterans that are here and make sure that they have the right attitude. Yeah, like, Alex Tange and Camilleri have both kind of hinted that they don't want to be here through a rebuild, so you, they should try to get rid of that influence so that way their negativity doesn't rub off on the other players that are coming up. Yeah, well, Tange was the guy that I've been thinking of for a while that had to go as soon as Jerome went, because ever since Jerome left, he has uh, said in the uh, in the media pretty much that he doesn't want to be here if Jerome wants to be here, and you can tell he hasn't played the same. So I've been thinking for a while if they're going to move a veteran, uh, it might be him. And, you know, Tange is fairly affordable. He's got, what, 
four seasons left at three point five million each. And Camilleri's got one at six million, so both are fairly affordable contracts to take on. Yeah, like Tanga he's gonna be a fifty to sixty point guy regardless more or less. And for three and a half million dollars, that is rather cheap. So Yeah, it's just he is not suitable for this team right now. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, if you can get anything for him, fine. And, yeah, the Flames need to try and find veteran players that have the right attitude and work ethic in order to have that rub off on the rookies. You need guys that have leadership abilities and want to be those leaders and those mentors. Yeah, like Eric Nystrom type, you know, puts everything out on the ice, even if he isn't the most skilled of players. And, yeah, like we already know that, like, Sven Berchi is a hard worker, and there's a lot of hard workers amongst the prospects. So, yeah, if that can kind of get ingrained into the team's mantra, then, yeah, that, that'll do nothing but make the rebuild shorter and more successful at the end yeah and and i think the more that you can have um you've got to take players that. who want to be here and want to be those mentors realizing you might not be the best guy on the team but you have a defined role the better our prospects are going to develop as well mm-hmm I've been uh, I've been kind of doing a little bit of research on most of the guys on the team. I was reading that Anton Babchuk is officially out of here next year. Now he signed a contract in the AHL. Yeah, as well as uh, Roman Chervenka, he went back right. to the KHL as well. Are you going to um, miss him, Chervenka? He was serviceable. You know, he didn't quite get as good of a shot, but he did get twelve million dollars for three years overseas so i can't really blame him you know you'd be stupid not to like yeah he'd, he'd only get maybe a million dollars here on a one-year deal do you think that like, closes the book on his nhl career though uh not necessarily but probably because how old is he he is uh 27 He's, yeah so he'll like, be 30 31 by the time that contract ends yeah it just depends but i don't think he'll be back not good enough of a player. Any other um, Flames vets you could see the fl- the Flames flipping for a decent asset before or at the draft? The only three that I could see are Camilleri, Stempniak, and Tange. Because you do need to have some players here. Yeah. Yeah, like... How do you say, in terms of value, you, like, you could get a lot for guys like Glenn Cross and Giordano, but... The only you know. other player I'd add to that list is if we could get a buyer for Corey Sarich, I'd move him. Yeah, but realistically, you're only going to get like a fourth round draft pick, so... Yeah. So let's assume that we were to move Camilleri for a late first round pick. Let's say the 25th through 30th pick. That then gives us three picks in the bottom 20. If you're Jay Feaster sitting at the draft table, do you try to then grab two of those picks in the bottom ten and try to flip them to move up even further? Nope. You think it's Uh, about quantity this year? Under normal circumstances, on an average draft, I would say, yeah, try and move up because usually there's only 10 to 12 above average players okay but this year there seems to be quite a lot of depth so yeah like guys that would normally be picked in the back half of the first round are stretching right through into the the middle of the second round so anytime you can get more of that like just think of it as like getting more prospects like jankowski in there yeah which depending on who it is picked like you're getting someone of that caliber so yeah that, like that's not bad no it's not um we've also heard feaster say that he is looking at moving draft picks he says that it's going to take too much they've had calls for the sixth overall pick but the price they want is too high for anybody 
but he has said the other two picks are in play if he can get the right deal. Do you see either of those picks moving? Do you think the Flames can do a deal to move up into the top five or move any of their picks to move up? Realistically, they could move up, but it, the costs might be prohibitive. Yeah, like the Flames aren't a year or two away from being a good team again. So, you know, by having three or four guys that are solidly above average prospects like that just going based off of odds that you're more likely to get someone that is actually going to impact your team for a long time the more you have in the first so yeah like uh, plus I don't see much of a huge drop from like 10 to like 22 either so yeah like, you can get a really good player at 22. So, so you're I don't saying see... it's not worth the Flames' effort to move up unless they can somehow get themselves into perhaps a top five spot? Yeah, but like realistically, you, it would be like 22, 28, plus like a Glenn Cross or a Giordano or perhaps even a Sven Berchi. Yeah. Which, at that cost, it's like, what? why bother? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, I'm still not convinced that someone in the top five is not going to drop um, into the sixth or seventh spot where we'll be able to pick them up. Um, I Personally, I, I don't know if the Flames will draft sixth. I think they will, but they have a history of trading down to get an extra pick, and I'd be okay, depending on who's on the board at that point, to drop to, say, eighth in exchange and get another second or third round pick for it. But I think there's going to be somebody who we're expecting to go in the top five still available when the Flames make their first pick, wherever that is. Yeah, well, if you count like the top five prospects being McKinnon, Drouin, Jones, Barkoff, and Nikushkin, like, likely you're going to see Nikushkin drop to six. Because yeah. Carolina, they're more Ontario Hockey League well, I think tight. they probably also might be going for a defenseman, too. I think uh, yeah, uh, they might take Dar- why, like, Darnell I, Nurse. Yeah, I, that's why I'm thinking that they're either going to take Nurse or they're going to take Monaghan. So, you know, and realistically, if, like, the selections between Nikushkin and Lindholm, I'd prefer Nikushkin just because he plays like Anze Kopitar, and, you know, that's always good. Yeah, and, and I mean, at the same time, we're at the mercy of everybody else, right? We'll take whoever falls of those five. Oh, yeah. The, definitely. Like, it, it's one of those odd times where no matter who gets picked in the top five, you're pretty much guaranteed a really good second or first line player out of it. Which is exactly what the Flames need at this point. So while we're talking about the draft and potential new faces, why don't we chat about the, I guess, newest face uh, of the Flames, which is Corbin Knight. And that was the, I thought it was so funny because the player most people have never heard of, but he was the biggest deal coming out of the Flames just because we've all been starved for Flames news. So Corbin Knight was acquired by the Flames from the Panthers in exchange for, what was it, a fourth round draft pick this year? Mm Mm-hmm. And he's a he's a high river kid, uh, so he's grown up Calgary or around Calgary. Looking at his stats and his NCAA numbers, we know that Feaster loves his NCAA guys. So I'm not surprised he drafted on uh, or not drafted, but traded for Knight. Um, he looks pretty good. I've watched some of his uh, his games and some footage that's online. He knows how to win a faceoff, which right now we really need. Have you yeah. seen any of his footage? Any comments on him from what you've seen? I have actually, and I, I was actually familiar with him because I'm a Panthers fan as well. Oh, right. So, <laughs> but um, he was actually one of the finalists along with John Gaudreau for the Hobie Baker this year. Oh, was he? Okay. So, yeah, he's obviously a, a quality player. Now, we shouldn't expect him to be come in and be like a 40, 50, 60 point guy right off the bat but he does have that kind of upside. He was the he actually set the record in uh, the University of North Dakota for most faceoffs won in a single season. So, you know, like and he was I do believe the best uh faceoff guy in the entire college ranks. 
So that will definitely help. Basically with him, I feel that he's gonna more profile out to be like our quality third line guy who can get like 40 points win a bunch of face-offs the guy that you throw out there first on the penalty kill and who's defensively responsible and all that so a lot of those qualities remind me of Eric Nystrom when he was here well except for the face-offs exactly if I recall Nystrom wasn't very good there (laughs) I I see him sort of being like Hanowski was last year that young guy you're bringing in who has a lot to learn but didn't look like he was lost on the team no um, so, do you think he will make the NHL next year? Oh, I'd be I'd be shocked if he wasn't on the team in some capacity. Okay, so perhaps somebody who's a call up or I think he makes it right from day you do? one. Okay, yeah. Well, well look if... at our center depth. We got Backlund and Stajan. That's and true. That's it. So. Yeah, unless we're going to trade for two or three guys, I don't see... Backlund, Stajan, and at this point, Camilleri. Yeah, but... Whether he stays here or not, we're not sure. (laughs) Um, So, uh, you know, I mean, if you look at it as far as um, quality of the deal then, trading a fourth-round pick for a player that will probably make the team, it's probably a pretty good deal for the Flames. Well, realistically, a fourth-round pick only has about a 15% chance of actually becoming an NHL player and playing 100 games, and you're pretty much guaranteed that with Knight. So even just on that aspect, even if his upside is limited, it's still a win. Yeah, yeah, I I guess you're, you're probably right there. And, you know, the part that feels best is I think we all heard Edmonton was also going after Corbin Knight, and we beat them to him. So, you know, it's always good when we can beat the Oilers. Definitely. Even the little victories count. Oh, yeah. The other guy that's been uh, – oh, and before we jump off Corbin Knight, uh, he's rumored to have signed or agreed to, I guess, a two-year contract but hasn't signed it yet. The Flames have to wait till July 5th to get some contracts off the book first. But a two-year deal – um, I'm not sure how much money, but it can't be that much. I'd say probably less than 700k. Even if it was a million bucks, who really cares? The other guy the Flames have uh, again not signed yet, but who's agreed to a deal is Kerry Ramo. Um, it's been reported he's re- he's signed a multi-year deal with the team, and again is just waiting till the fifth to come over here. Yeah, it, just the whole 50 contract thing. So if Ramo joins the team, that's going to make for a crowded crease in the uh, training camp. Do you think Ramo's kind of the shoe-in for the starting goalie position? I figure that he and McDonald are likely 1-2, and with Barra being the wild card. Realistically, I could see each of them like getting like a third or so of the starts in the year, just... I wouldn't actually mind going with the three-headed monster. Yeah, and I think a lot of that will depend on how they play, too. Yeah, you gotta do the rebuild right. (laughs) So the only other, I guess, pressing Flames news that's come out since the last time we uh, were on the air was the talk about the Flames pushing Ken King aside from the hockey operations side, moving him more towards working on the new building and bringing in a new director of hockey operations. And there's been a couple names floated around there, but the biggest name I think that everyone's heard is Brennan Shanahan. What would you think of Evan Shanny joining the organization? I, yeah, it's one of those things where as long as they're good at what they do, fine. So, like, if it's Shanahan or someone else, I, I don't really... You know, it's hard to say exactly because it, the whole position itself is somewhat poorly defined. Well, that's so, it. It's very murky, and it's like, why do we need a hockey guy when we have a GM? So, yeah, it almost becomes a committee of the GM and somebody else at that point. Mm-hmm. And I think you were the one that told me, speaking of front office positions and stuff that's not well defined, the special assistant to the GM, which is a position I've never actually understood, uh, Craig Conroy, is 
going to be the general manager for the Abbotsford Heat this year, who in the end will be staying in Abbotsford. Yeah. And he, Conroy will be in Calgary operating out of here with the team. Um, I think it's. I think it wouldn't be a bad idea, just going back to Shanahan, to bring somebody like him in here. Um, I think... As long as he and Feaster get together, the last thing you want you see you hear about this all the time is hockey minds in an organization that aren't on the same page, and I think that's where it'll screw things up going forward. At this point, we need a cohesive front office. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that they need to ha- make sure that anyone they hire is not going to do things their way, and that they're on they're... board with whatever the long term plan is that's been set out. Yeah. You know, because the Flames actually have been doing things organizationally fairly decent, even though certain things fell through. So, you know, you know, like you'd hate to see them deviate from their plan when things like getting Corbin Knight and other or transactions have actually seemed like good moves. So, you know, just... I'd, I'm actually kind of curious to see exactly how they're going to do things. So, yeah. And it's only, not like, only time it's not like tell Edmonton. There. Yeah, it's not like it's like Edmonton where you just kind of go, oh, God, what are they going to do now? Only so. time will tell. Um, as far as Connie being moved to Abbotsford. I think that might be the team's way of kind of grooming him for a larger organization within the team, maybe an AGM spot in the future or even a GM job in the future. What do you think? Oh, I could definitely see it. And, you know, he has a good personality for that kind of thing. So, you know, even if it's not with us in the future, if he gets hired out somewhere else, you know, it's good for him. So... Yeah, I have no complaints. So, Matt, any other uh, Flames topics you want to chat about today? No, I'm just looking forward to the draft and, you know, still haven't had the Stanley Cup awarded as of yet. So, you know, congrats to whomever that is. Whoever wins, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that in our next episode because that series is going to be over very shortly here. Yeah, and, yeah, I just hope that the Flames uh, can get some good prospects in and, you know, finish their renovations on the Dome as quickly as possible and try to return some normalcy to the city. Yeah, I hope the Dome is rebuilt. I hope uh, Stampy Park and I hope everyone that's lost their home, the buildings downtown... Um, that everything gets rebuilt in good time and that we can get Calgary back to normal Mm -hmm. the way it was. This is going to take a long time to really clean up this mess, but as normal as we can get as quick as possible is ideal. Yeah, and everybody in Calgary just stays safe. You know, And again, we will have a Red Cross donation link on the Fireside Chat website if people want to donate to Red Cross. Um, I think aside from financial donations, there's so much that's going to be need to be done in the coming weeks. Everyone has different skills they can help with. So engage in your community, engage with Calgary, watch the city's website. They'll tell you about volunteer opportunities, but let's all pitch in to get this uh, city back to normal. Yep. All right, Matt. Well, we will talk to you probably next week. I think we'll do another show post draft and pre UFA. And uh, see what the Flames ended up doing at the draft table. Yep. Take care, everyone. This is Dan and Matt signing off. Oh, we are the boys of Chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.